2024 NEI Synapse features an educational program chock full of the latest advances in psychopharmacology and cutting-edge research on treatment strategies, side effects, drug interactions, and management. If you have yet to do so, register today for the 7th annual event being held April 19th through the 21st in person in Las Vegas and online via simulcast. Use discount code PODCAST to save $100 on your registration at nei.global forward slash synapse. Discount good on new registrations only. Welcome to the NEI Podcast. On this show, psychiatrist, psychopharmacologist, and mental health advocate, Dr. Andrew Cutler sits with renowned mental health experts from a range of backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. Hello and welcome to another NEI podcast. Uh, Today is a very interesting podcast because we're going to be talking about something that seems to be very uh, popular in uh, the public and in the press. Uh, This is mindfulness-based stress reduction for anxiety disorders. And with me from uh, Washington, D.C. is Dr. Elizabeth Hoagie. How are you, Liz? Fine. How are you? Nice to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, which, Which institution are you at again? I'm at Georgetown University Medical Center, Mm -hmm. uh, where I run the Anxiety Disorders Research Program. Fantastic. And your research has been focused on mindfulness and other techniques, is that correct? Yes. So, um, you know, over the years, I've uh, done research on different strategies to treat anxiety disorders. And in the early days, it was pharmaceuticals and Mm -hmm. psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. and then more recently, uh, mind-body approaches. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's terrific. I mean, they're low tech. They have a, a low uh, toxic toxicity, I guess you could say, low risk. So, yeah. you know, I think a lot of the audience is probably familiar with specific kinds of therapies. Of course, CBT being the one we're all trained in. But are there other evidence based treatments for anxiety disorders? Well, just big picture. Mm-hmm. Just taking a step back, mm-hmm. when people come to the clinic. They're usually, as you know, offered an SSRI or some other antidepressant Mm -hmm. or um, CBT, which, of course, as you know, has great evidence base behind it, Mm -hmm. uh, especially if a person has an avoidance-based anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes there's patients who don't feel comfortable in a mental health treatment sort of context, and they don't want to talk to a doctor. They want to do something different to try to uh, treat their anxiety symptoms. And that's one of the reasons why we decided to do this study where we compare mindfulness meditation with one of these standard treatments. Mm -hmm. Not that those treatments don't work Mm -hmm. or that they're not effective, but just that we wanted to increase the options that people have. Yeah. Yeah. CBT, of course, you you have to have someone who is appropriately trained and skilled, uh, you have to have access, you have to have, there's cost issues and things like that. So is mindfulness something that someone could just do on their own, if you will? Well, um, it can be done yeah. that way, yeah. but what I, the only data I have is for a group-based intervention okay. where people are coming in person to learn meditation from a very carefully trained meditation teacher. I see. So the distinction there is that it's not a clinician where someone has to have a license, a medical or you know psych- psychology license, but somebody who is instead uh, expert in meditation itself. Okay, that makes sense. So that potentially broadens the reach of this modality to people. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, CPT works great, but at our clinic, there's at least a two-month waiting list. Oh my it's goodness. just hard to, there's not enough people to do it. Yeah. Um, now, you're saying mindfulness and meditation, so maybe people aren't exactly clear on what the difference is. What is mindfulness meditation? How is that different from other types of meditation? Yeah, so that's an important question. Um, I think that sometimes terms are used interchangeably, and mm-hmm. you know, just to be precise, the type that we used, which is called mindfulness, which just means mindfulness meditation, comes from uh, originally, originally comes from the Vipassana Buddhist tradition, okay. uh, which is um, 
popular in Southeast Asia and parts of India, and it's been around for thousands of years. Um, and that is the type of meditation that is typically used for mindfulness or shamatha practices. Uh, sometimes you, people do meditation, which is from the yoga tradition, mm -hmm. which is more of like a Hindu-derived mm -hmm. um, uh, practice. In that other kind of meditation, the focus is on relaxation, mm -hmm. right? Because there's uh, all kinds of also thousands of years old practices designed to relax the body, which is great and useful, but it's distinct from mindfulness, which is more about just noticing whatever's there without trying to change it. Oh, so for example, in the mindfulness meditation, you're, you pay attention to the breath, but you're not trying to change it okay. because the whole point is to see reality more clearly. What's really happening? Not trying to make some kind of change. Oh, I see. Okay. And how many uh, sessions are there? So we use a sort of packaged approach, which is called the MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, primarily because that was the most uh, evidence-based okay. sort of package of uh, mindfulness training. And it's already been used in research. It's already standardized and mm -hmm. protocolized. So we could feel confident that we were using a um, program which could be repeated at different centers for over hundreds of patients. Got it. But basically, it's an eight-week um, group-based program. So participants who are randomized into the trial went for um, you know evenings usually mm -hmm. for two and a half hours uh -huh. uh, in person, about 12 or 15 people in the class, Got it. and then a very experienced meditation teacher who would take them through different exercises, explain a little bit of the background and the uh, meaning of different concepts, and also do, um, you know, formally led meditation, closed eye practices, mm -hmm. such as breath awareness or a body scan, or even some um, gentle movement exercises, which are all done in a particular way, uh, the, the mindful um, approach, which is, you know, paying attention to whatever's happening, but with openness and acceptance. I see. And, and these two and a half hour sessions are once a week over eight weeks. Is that right? Exactly. Wow. That doesn't sound like a too in, invasive or too much of a time commitment. No. Well, there's also homework. Oh, there okay. There actually <laughs> are suggested 40 yes. minute exercises that people do uh, at home. And yes. so, you know, of course, we encourage people, they, they do whatever they can. But it's like any skill where you're learning like a new musical instrument, the more you do the practice, the right. better you get at it. That makes sense. Um, I realize this study was eight weeks long. Do you have any data on persistence on, on an enduring effect? Well, we did collect follow-up data, but um, unfortunately, with this kind of clinical trial, we couldn't ask people to not engage in other treatments. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have, uh, like, if you do nothing else, mm -hmm. <laughs> does the treatment persist? Mm -hmm. We don't really know because people uh, started see. other medications or they started sure. psychotherapy and we couldn't stop them. So sure. um, overall, the, the changes look like they're, I mean, the findings that we found at eight weeks look to be consistent to 12 and 24 weeks. Sure. But I don't know for sure what people are doing. Well, it could be that they're doing what they learned and, and practiced. So it's not that this is a cut and dried finite treatment. It could be ongoing, right? It could be, yeah. yes. And there's other groups working on that. Oh, great. Well, that sounds great. Um, you know, this was actually a study, a formal clinical trial that you did that was published in a very prestigious journal, JAMA Psychiatry, last year. And I understand that the title of this study was the TAME study, which I think is cute. Treatments for Anxiety, Meditation, and Escitalopram. So maybe you could just walk us through this study a little bit and tell us what you found. Yeah, sure. So um, we basically wanted to compare, as I said, the sort of gold standard antidepressant treatment, mm -hmm. which has already been shown to be effective mm -hmm. over hundreds of patients mm -hmm. in you know well-controlled RCT trials, which are a requirement for FDA approval. Right. And so using that as a gold standard, uh, we use a non-inferiority design. So instead mm -hmm. of trying to show that a drug is better than right. something else, like, like typically a placebo, in right. this case, we're trying to show that the new treatment, the MBSR meditation, 
was non-inferior to the drug. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds like, mm -hmm. you know, not like, yay, I'm not inferior. Right. It doesn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't overwhelm one with confidence, but it actually is a type of study design that's Absolutely. used by the FDA for a registry trial. Yes. So it's legit. And yes. we use all the uh, very careful um, methodological mm -hmm. uh, techniques that were required. Mm -hmm. For example, you have to set a non-inferiority margin in advance mm -hmm. and you know publish it, mm -hmm. which we have in our another paper yeah. that tells exactly where the new treatment shall be in re relationship to the old treatment at the primary uh, endpoint. Yeah, as a matter of fact, this is the design that's used in much of the rest of the world to get drugs approved. We're the only country in the world that requires placebo controlled. Uh, no? stati statistical significance over placebo. That's what I've spent my career doing is pharmaceutical trials for 30 years wow. to get FDA approval. Okay, um, and escitalopram was the SSRI chosen. What's interesting is I, I told you I just recently came back from Southeast Asia speaking for the company Lundbeck, and uh, escitalopram is actually approved throughout the world for a variety of anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety, panic, social, uh, OCD. So it really was probably an excellent choice because of that broad range of, of approvals. Exactly. Yes. And it tends to be well tolerated yes. and doesn't interact with other medications as much. Yeah. So probably not a lot of unblinding either. It's not a drug that's overwhelmingly sedating, for instance, or something. Right. Of course, we can't do blinding in this kind of design because people know whether they're taking a drug or whether they're assigned to a class. Oh, so I see. Actually, that is an in, uh, important point because how can we do blinding? How could we use blinding at all mm -hmm. in this kind of design? Mm -hmm. The only way we could do it was mm -hmm. to take uh, blinded assessors mm -hmm. and have those clinicians interview the patients oh, at various time points, Got it. baseline, Got it. you know, in between endpoint. Those people did not know which treatment group that the Got patient it. was in, and therefore they could maintain the blind, but only single blind, of course. Okay. So this was not a placebo-controlled trial then. Everybody got either escitalopram or the, the intervention. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, there's a way. There's another way to blind it. Of course, everybody could take a pill, you know, and some of them would get placebo, some would get real escitalopram. We tried, we tried to send that grant oh, to the NIMA, yeah. and they were like, there is no treatment in the world that would look like this. Like yeah. this is not, there's no real well, world. Well, you could just have groups where people sit around and talk and share things, but no training happens. Like a sham group, if you will. Yeah. 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 No, I get it. Okay. So the idea then is to show that uh, these uh, interventions are, are not inferior, not compared to placebo specifically. And that's a very, you're right. It's a very rational design. Um, what kinds of participants were included? Were there specific anxiety disorders or not? Yes. Uh, so we did include all of the main anxiety disorders. And the reason is that there, there's so much overlap yes. and there's so much sure. similarity in symptoms, although they are, you know, you can describe discrete differences between them. But when somebody has, for example, panic disorder, mm -hmm. it's very common that they also have generalized anxiety disorder. That's or true. same for social anxiety, often is comorbid with generalized anxiety disorder. So true. it just made more sense to include anybody who had a anxiety disorder. Got it. And related to that, we also allowed people to have comorbid depression. Okay. Because yeah. as you know, so many people, yeah. especially for GAD, in fact, there's one epidemiologic study that said 60% comorbidity right. between GAD and MDD. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't make sense to try to right. untangle that and, and, and because there's so many um, symptoms that overlap, That's you know, it would be helpful to have a treatment that could be helpful for both. That is true. I've done, uh, as I mentioned, clinical trials over my career. I've done several GAD studies, and it's hard when they are trying to get pure, quote, pure GAD without depression. It's very hard. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, of course, that uh, you used the DSM-5 definition, so you, d you didn't include OCD or PTSD because they're no longer considered anxiety disorders, although when we grew exactly. up in training, they were. Yes. Yes. Okay. But they really are phenomenologically different yes. enough. Yes, yes. Yes, I agree. Okay, um, and so now you've identified your participants. How many how many uh, subjects were there in this study? So we had uh, two hundred and seventy six. My goodness, uh, this was a three site study. So DC, 
uh, my colleagues at NYU in New York mm -hmm. and at Mass General in Boston. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked together to recruit patients from our own sites, and then we pooled the data. Um, and at the, the, the JAMA paper that you mentioned is the group that is described, which is uh, 276 participants, half going into MBSR okay. and half on the drug. That's a very large uh, study for this kind of study. Um, how long did it take to recruit the subjects? Uh, it was about three years. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that takes a long time. Um, did you did you do anything with marijuana? I mean, how was that handled? I know when I'm recruiting for clinical trials, that's always an issue. Do you allow people, you know, screen positive or not? Yeah. It's a it's a problem because our society is sort of changing its mm -hmm. mind about the use. So we didn't exclude it unless it was considered a substance use disorder. Got it. So as long as people weren't, it wasn't causing problems for them and their uh, functioning. Were there any other major inclusion or exclusion criteria, for instance, other concomitant medications and things like that? Well, they couldn't be on an antidepressant okay. because obviously we're giving them an antidepressant. Right. Um, a lot of people are on benzodiazepines. Not a lot, actually. I think it ended up being only about 15%. Oh, okay. But um, that's a, it's hard to have somebody totally discontinue those. And yeah. if we did, it would change the yeah. their um, symptoms. So mm -hmm. we figured it would make more sense to just keep whatever they were taking at a um, consistent, steady dose mm -hmm. throughout the trial. And then if they wanted to change it afterwards, then. By the way, mm -hmm. people who enrolled in the trial at the DC site we're also given the option after the study ends, like at the very end, no more data collection, we allowed them to try the other treatment that they didn't get. Oh, interesting. Which was uh, very illuminating, but uh, just, you know, I can tell you stories about that if you want. Oh, I'm very interested in that, actually, of course. Okay, well. You can't tease that and not tell us more. <laughs> I, what I meant was, like, let me finish describing yes, it Yes, of course, of course. You know, we'll get back to that. Procedures, and then I can tell you a little bit about sure. that. Sure. Um, I'm also wondering, was there a certain cutoff, a symptom cutoff for the severity of anxiety at entry or something like that? I, I would think you'd have to have some something to measure there. We thought that if they met criteria for an ongoing anxiety disorder, that that would be good enough. Okay. Because typically people who are willing to be in a research study, mm -hmm. you know, and have to do all these extra procedures mm -hmm. and filling out these forms and mm -hmm. having extra visits, like mm -hmm. it's very intensive, mm -hmm. that they were motivated enough mm -hmm. because of the, you know, impairment that they were experiencing. I see. So they're help seeking, in other words, these are exactly. who are seeking help. At baseline, okay, that makes sense. So this is a very much a real world kind of intervention. Then that's the idea. It's it's you know comparative effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it was um, uh, funded by PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and they're very interested in um, patient centeredness and comparative effectiveness and real life. You know, with real patients with comorbidities and um, you know other yeah. things that make it. Um, more generalizable. Yeah, as opposed to a lot of pharmaceutical trials where it's a very homogeneous population and you're, it doesn't necessarily generalize. And what was your primary outcome measure? So we use the clinical global impression of severity. Mm -hmm. And that's also um, due to the fact that we are using, uh, that we were studying different disorders because, mm -hmm. as you know, there's mm -hmm. like one scale yeah. or instrument. For each disorder. And That's so if right. you're doing like pan anxiety, then you have to find something that can be used for all different. And so we created an anchored version mm -hmm. of the CGIS mm -hmm. where the, when we trained clinicians at every site to use this structured version where they could, you know, they were going through all these other things. We, we, we did do the, for example, Hamilton anxiety and okay. the panic disorder severity scale yeah. and the, you know, Leibowitz social anxiety, all of those for the different kinds of anxiety. And at the end, they came up with this global impression based on different um, aspects of anxiety, okay. uh, like frequency, intensity, and distress. Oh, I see. And how often were the assessments done? Was that weekly? Um, every other week, okay. so that we had you know z weeks zero to four, six, and eight. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I'm wondering about uh, side effects or adverse events. Yeah. So as you can imagine, 
there was one one of the arms had way more <laughs> yeah. adverse events than yeah. the other. And yes. that's, you know, that was expected. And that's mm-hmm. actually part of the reason we did the research is because patients wanted to know, like, mm-hmm. you know, how, how does this compare? Like, if, it, if they're really the same in efficacy, why, and I care about side effects, why would I take the drug, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was a high percent of people in the drug group had adverse events like terrible ones, right. you know, sort of expected. What we see in clinic all the time: sure. you know, someone tar- starts Lexapro, they have nausea for yep. seven to ten days, and it goes away. Yep. But that still counted here. Sure. So I think it was a you know more than half people had some kind of side effect. Whereas in the meditation group, mm-hmm. it was much much less, more like fifteen percent or ten percent of patients. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine what kind of adverse events would you see there? Would it be a, I don't know headache or <laughs> something? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, the top one was actually anxiety. Oh, okay. And my suspicion was that people, uh, when they're meditating, now this is, I'm just, we didn't measure this. All right. But this is my, this is my guess. Yeah. People who haven't meditated before yes. and have anxiety, sometimes, you know, they're, when, pe- so, I, just to go back for a moment, the instructions in, for example, breath awareness meditation mm-hmm. exercise is to pay attention to the breath and allow whatever mental phenomena to arise. Okay. And so that's thoughts or emotions or memories or f- physical sensations, whatever. Sure. Just allow it to arise. Just notice it, you yes. know, with this non judgmental stance, right. accepting kindness, kind to yourself stance. Well, People who have been staying busy to try to avoid right. having right. those come up right. all of a sudden have a lot right. of those anxi- anxious thoughts I'm and sure. worries and, sure. you know, maybe memories or whatever comes up. And so they feel anxious. Right. So this would be something I would expect early on then. Did you notice that more in the earlier weeks as people were just getting started with this technique? We didn't We didn't track it that way. Oh. We, we, I don't have that data. Okay. Uh, th- that would just be my theory, that initially you would see a little bit of that, and then gradually that would get better with time. Uh, you know, just like sometimes starting an SSRI, you can see a little bit of agitation initially until the serotonin yeah. receptors re- re-regulate. Exactly. Okay, well, that's fascinating. And what was the, uh, what's the punchline? What was the findings? Oh, okay. Efficacy was. So huh. we did find that MBSR was non-inferior to the drug. Oh, wow. So the um, eight-week CGIS mean was in the um, predetermined Mm -hmm. non-inferiority margin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So, so, but improvement was seen, I'm assuming, in both groups. Yes. To a similar degree, I guess. A similar degree. The drug numerically stronger, but Mm -hmm. the meditation not... Far behind. Yeah, I did look at the article. I was very surprised how similar they were, as a matter of fact, which is good. So what would you say the implications are? I mean, I, I can think of my own sort of conclusions, but I'm wondering what your think, thoughts are. Well, the most uh, basic would just be that uh, we have a, another option for patients to consider mm-hmm. at, that they can feel more confident about mm-hmm. having a, a, a significant e- effect and then clinicians, either primary care or psychiatrists or psychologists, can feel confident recommending mm-hmm. mindfulness meditation to their patients who are interested, who are willing to do, you know, the practice. Absolutely. Um, b- knowing that it may be just as good as a, a drug. Yeah. I don't even necessarily see this as an either or. Certainly these are complement can be complementary. And, uh, you know, as we have evidence on, say, CBT, the combo of CBT with antidepressants works better than either alone. So I don't see why you couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How would somebody find a provider or find this methodology near them, whether it's a patient seeking this or a provider who wants to be able to refer for this? Yes. Um, so I I can't make statements about mindfulness packaged, you know, practices that are different than MBSR because mm-hmm. we only use this one. Mm-hmm. Although there are several others that are mm-hmm. that are um, similar, but um, MBSR, this sort of program, mm-hmm. this eight week program, is um, offered in all 
major cities at this point oh, in the U.S. Okay. and also internationally. Wow. So if somebody just searches on the internet, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mm -hmm. it's commonly uh, offered at sometimes hospitals, but also um, like at a community center mm -hmm. or um, people at some workplaces have mm -hmm. um, offered the class or, you know, uh, trying to think other other like churches, sure. I've seen it, sure. or other types of uh, non-clinical settings. So there are local organizations then that would, would offer this. So again, just for our audience, this is Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, or MBSR. That's and, and I like how you said mindfulness meditation. That's a nice kind of way of thinking of it. Uh, to distinguish this, of course, from either just mindfulness or just meditation, I guess this is subset. So I don't think the word mindfulness itself, I mean, there is a, a psychology use of that term, mm -hmm. but it's it's there's nothing different in in the meditation mm -hmm. realm. There's nothing different about mindfulness than mindfulness meditation. I see. It's just the shorthand that people are using. But I see. typically, when people say mindfulness, they mean a closed eyes practice in which they are experiencing the mental phenomena that arise in this particular stance, non judgmentally, with kindness, openness, and so on. And you can extrapolate that practice to other activities. So for example, mindful walking mm -hmm. is another way of doing, my, sometimes it's too hard. People fall asleep when they're sitting down. Right. So there is something called mindful walking, which also comes from Vipassana Buddhism, okay. where you walk very, very slowly, like just like one step every five seconds, mm -hmm. I mean, very slowly. And you're uh -huh. noticing all the different perceptions in your foot and, you know, in your knees and what's happening here and what's and anything that arises is fair game, right? You want to be able to pay attention to uh, any f experience that arises and just noting it like, oh, well, that's happening, but not glomming onto it or not evaluating it because. for whether it's true or not like you would in CBT, right? Okay. But just saying, oh, there's a thought. Yeah, there, hi. Okay. <laughs> and then allowing it to pass, I you know, see. sort of saying, just nodding to it, not fighting it, right? Not having yeah. a struggle or... But just like, oh, allowing it to arise and pass away. I see. So maybe I'm confused. So my, you are talking about mindfulness then. That's if Yeah. Mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, same thing. Okay. Thank you. That's a very helpful clarification because I think a lot of people are just starting to get aware of this, become mindful of mindfulness, if you will, if I could use that. And um, so they may be interested in, in what are we talking about here, defining the terms. Now... I have a sort of a basic question here. As someone who's very interested in neurobiology, I'm sure there's neurobiologic hypotheses about how these kind of treatments can work. What what are some of the thoughts here about how this works, and maybe at a mechanistic level even? So it's it has been completely worked out. I'm sure, um, but there are definitely people doing work in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember how I said it's not about relaxation, mm -hmm. where, you know, there are people who are looking at relaxation-focused relaxation, relaxation -focused therapies, and that seems to be more like, you know, inc increasing vagal tone, kind of. But that's not this. In oh, fact, doing mindfulness where you just allow anything to arise, let's say, from the unconscious bubbling up, that can be very distressing yes. and very provocative. Yes. And the whole point is just to, you know, not run away or you know, not grab the thought and not just, you know, abhor the thought, but just be accepting and say, oh, yeah, there's that thought again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Having that thought that I'm bad or whatever. Remem remembering that time I said that thing I wish I hadn't said, yeah, yeah, there it is again. <laughs> like an old friend, you yeah. just like, oh, yeah, that, there's that thought. And so the this is more of a cognitive explanation, yeah. but the idea is that it creates a different relationship with thoughts okay. or other mental phenomena. So the thought arises and instead of like, oh my gosh, I have to assess whether that thought is real or I okay. have to decide whether, I don't know, something that is strongly identifying with the thought, right. that falls away. I and the see. person instead can just experience there's a thought out there. It's not me. It's a thought. Okay. And it's not real. Right. It's just a mental phenomena, oh, and it's going to pass away, just like all other thoughts and all other emotions and many other types of right yes. mental phenomena. It just comes and goes, and we don't have to have a, a big reaction to it. And that tends to be freeing for people. Yeah, I can imagine not assigning this valence to it, this emotional tone. To it. Uh, 
So that's one hypothesis. Mm -hmm. It has to do with changing the relationship with thoughts. Mm -hmm. Another hypothesis that's a little bit more biological is the idea that um, meditation is like an exposure exercise. Okay. (laughs) As we sort of alluded to before, if there's thoughts, perhaps, that are being avoided, then you can't help but experience those when you're meditating, when you there's nothing to distract right. the person. And so if they're just having little bits of exposure, like, oh, that memory. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> you know, and so they're just like little bites of it. And it might operate as an exposure exercise. That makes some. sense too. Either way. So And then finally yeah, there's but- another hypothesis about interoception. Mm-hmm. And this is um people are interested in what happens when people are connected to their bodies? So mm-hmm. all of the m- mindfulness exercises and many other types of meditation direct the attention towards the body. What's happening in the body? What's a person's feeling? Mm-hmm. Um, not just emotionally, but uh, physically in their body. Mm-hmm. And there, there is um, hypotheses about why that tends to be healing. Um, that that are, I'm, I'm I don't know the details, but people are measuring. Like, for example, in MRI studies, um, how the changes in interoception track along with clinical benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly fascinating, too. Um, I'm just fascinated by the idea of just paying attention to the thoughts and the feelings and not trying to judge them, control them, interpret them, if you will. It's... um, it's hard to be that passive nowadays. Well, yes, <laughs> yes. But remember, the mind, you know, is the meaning-making machine. Yes. So, you know, the thought comes up and they're like, well, wait, is that is that true? Mm-hmm. Is that really bad? Mm-hmm. Was that bad enough? Mm-hmm. Or whatever, And the, you know, the com- all kinds of things. And there was, a, um, there was a famous saying by the Buddha who said something like, we can't actually see the real world because, you know, in our in our mind, there's a reflection of the real world, mm-hmm. like sort of the back of the retina, that yes. gets painted on by previous experience and expectations and desires and avoidance and all that stuff yeah. gets painted on the mirror so you can no longer see it. Right. Instead, you see what you expect to see or what you don't, ex- you know, want to see or whatever the the associations that the mind makes. Yeah, of course. Well, that makes sense, too. Um, you mentioned that there was a, a certain part of your cohort that had depression. Did you subanalyze the data to look at depressed versus non-depressed folks to see if there's anything there? That is, um, we're working on that right now. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. That's very, very um, good question that I'll sure. be able to report in a little while. Great, mining the data. That's always good. So I would imagine, of course, this would be helpful for that as well, but that's a testable hypothesis, so we'll have to see. I can tell you about the people who uh, crossed over into the other um, yes. treatment yes. after the study because that was only available at one site, so we didn't do any data collection with it. But um, just anecdotally, I did have patients who, for example, went through the meditation, and after the end of the study, you know, six months later, they're like, okay. I, you know, that was nice, but can I have the drug now? <laughs> okay. So then they, they came to my clinic uh-huh. and I prescribed the medication. And a couple of those people were like, wow, oh. this works so much better. Wow. Interesting. But there were also people in the other category, uh-huh. people who tried the drug and they're like, I hate the way this makes me feel. Right. This is so uncomfortable. I don't like this drug. You know, and they would go up, stay on it for eight weeks. So they would, you know, complete the trial and then they would stop. And then six months later, they come back and say, can I do the meditation class for free? Yes. Which is what, you know, a perk that we offered. Sure. They said yes. And so they went through the class and some of those people said, this is so much better. Yes. <laughs> this yes. really changes, you know, the way I see myself in the world or the way that I experience my thoughts or the way that I, um, you know, react to my own uh, mental phenomena. So it was fascinating to see that the two treatments while both effective, can be quite different in different people. And that's the next step is to try to figure out what's what's different about those groups of people so that we exactly. can be more you know, pre- precise about recommending treatments. Well, exactly. And it gets back to what you said at the beginning. It's nice to have options so that people can choose whichever one seems to work best for them. 
Um, it reminds me a few months ago, I was in Japan speaking to some colleagues, and we got onto the discussion of psychedelics. And one of the doctors in Japan said to me, I don't see psychedelics ever taking off in Japan because we just don't want to lose control. We don't like giving up control to the trip, and and that would be too scary for us. And it made me think, well, maybe that's true, that some people would be better for one kind of treatment than another. You know, it's funny. There are people working on the, uh, through fMRI brain states, Mm -hmm. similarities between psychedelics and meditation oh. because there appear to be there appears to be some overlap and I would also add that according to the uh, Buddhist tradition there is an egolessness state in deep meditation states so I would expect the same kind of uh, result from the two those two approaches Yes, me as well. I, I find that fascinating. And of course, you know, psychedelics, of course, is a whole other topic. We, uh, Dr. Stahl and I did a series of podcasts on those, and there's a, a real controversy, as you can imagine, around them. And one of the many controversies is, is the trip even you know, necessary that these are drugs that are very biologically active, do induce neuroplasticity on their own? Or, it, or is it, again, am I thinking too simplistically of this either-or conundrum, this dichotomy? Is, is it all of the above? Um, you know, you know that, that strikes me that about thinking of similarities of treatments. Um, the, the mindfulness practice itself, this is a, a side, putting aside psychedelics for a moment. Yes. There is another treatment that mindfulness practice feels similar to, and that is actually traditional psychodynamic psychotherapy. Oh. Like psychoanalytic psychotherapy because, and I remember when I was getting trained in the meditation and also I did a, a, a part-time um, fellowship in psychoanalytic psychodynamic approaches mm-hmm. at Mass General. And both of my mentors at that time said, do the little, you know, saying, don't just do something, sit there. Right. You know, because that's exactly. equally applicable yes. to meditation and psychodynamics. Because in psychodynamics, right, the the uh, clinician is saying basically to the patient, you just tell me whatever mm-hmm. arises in your mind, and I'll just be here That's to listen and watch. To witness. You know, yeah. we're sitting on a train, and you're looking out the window, uh-huh. and I'm you're telling me what you're seeing, and we're both, and the therapist is modeling to uh, to be non judgmental, open, mm-hmm. accepting. Mm-hmm. And kind, and so that's basically the same stance as in mindfulness meditation. That is fascinating. Uh, it really is. Of course, unfortunately, uh, we don't get trained as much these days in, in this techniques. Um, it's very difficult as a practitioner. I'm sure many people in the audience would resonate. It's just difficult. We're, we're we have a lot of pressure on us to see people very quickly and to prescribe medications and things like that. So I'm not sure how much uh, uh, physicians and maybe nurse practitioners can deliver this, although maybe they can on the side. But again, I have friends who say I do just enough psychopharm to support my psychotherapy practice. (laughs) My habit, my psychotherapy habit. I like it. Right, right. that's great. All right, Um, you know, I have to, of course, in the modern world, everything's digitalized, and there are now apps, and there are websites and things. So. Would this type of modality lend itself potentially to some type of digitalization? So, so to answer that, I'm going to tell you what happened to our study during the pandemic. Oh, that's right. You were doing it during COVID. Because we got just enough patients to do our main analysis before the pandemic, but we continued to do the data collection and to enroll patients during the pandemic because... We thought it was actually an important question to see whether these yes. treatments could be adapted online. Yes. So we had the opportunity, now I'm going to talk about unpublished data, All right. to compare the online and in-person treatments. When you so say online, you mean virtual? Like with a virtual, you know, like a Zoom virtual. type platform. Okay, good. Like a Zoom yes. type, yes. yes. Okay, uh, and it. I should use the term synchronous because yes. there's a lot of confusion when right. people say online, virtual, whatever. Right. This is a synchronous class, right. the exact same class, the MBSR class, oh, right. done on Zoom. Got it. So the same amount of face-to-face time, Got it. but, you know, computer <laughs> screen right. face, but still like cameras on, 
Yes. We made everything as much the same as we could. Right. And we also did the drug, deli- you know, the drug uh, visits with um, the pharm- psychopharmacologist mm-hmm. on Zoom. Right. So, you sure. know, still seeing the person, still had a chance to do, you know, everything else the same. And then the raters, I and assume, were Zoom, Zoom interactions, exactly. the ratings. Yeah. Exactly. We just moved the entire thing onto Zoom, yeah. basically. Yeah. But when we looked at the the two treatments, so remember, you know, one the gold standard is here, and we, you know, the new treatment is just below it, mm-hmm. and they're statistically non inferior. Right. But when we continued that into the pandemic, they started to separate. Mm-hmm. So, technically speaking, in the online phase of the study, we did not find non inferiority. Oh, I see. So the drug was superior, or the Yes, yes. Look better. That is fascinating. And we think that it's probably because MBSR didn't work as well Yes, yes. Because when people were online. And so that worries me because then I think, what if you take the human being out of it completely mm-hmm. and you just have a recording? Right, right. The asynchronous version, yes. right, which people are doing because it's convenient. Yes. If we do that, it's probably going to be even worse. Yes. And now what if we have something that's not even people talking or you never even meet another human being at all? You don't talk to anyone. You don't communicate with anyone. You're just watching instructional videos or reading text. I I have a lot of doubts about whether this type of work could be uh, meaningfully taught. Well, that is fascinating because I'm sure there are apps out there. That purport oh, to do this, yeah. There's thousands, thousands yes. of meditation apps. Exactly. And now, if if I were talking to a patient who said, "Shall I do this app or nothing?" Mm-hmm. I would say, "Fine, do the app." Mm-hmm. But if they said, "Shall I do this app or go to this in-person class?" Yeah. I would say, "Go to the in-person class." And the reason why is sometimes meditation can bring up on. Un- unusual experiences, like just, mm-hmm. you know, perceptual disturbances or other kinds of unusual experiences. And that's why there's a meditation teacher who can walk you through it, who can help you through it. And that's been the model for 2,000 years, right? Since yes. the Buddha, is that there's somebody who can, you know, help you along the way. And then when you're in a class, you hear the other people asking questions right. and, you know, inquiring. You're like, oh, that, I had that too. Or yes. what about this? Or, you know, so it provides so much more support. Well, there again, it's it's a shared journey. It's a shared experience, if you will, and those are best done in person. Also, as we well know, um, you know, our our bodies, our brains are wired to to pick up on things in person that you can't get in a yeah. two dimensional environment. You know, <laughs> yes. whether it's pheromones yeah. or electricity or who knows what. But right, there really exactly. is something about that. Of course, if it's that or nothing, I'm not going to tell my patient don't do it. But I'm not yes. going to tell my patient it's equivalent to drug. Okay. Because that's not true. It's only equivalent to drug if it's done in person. Interesting. And of course, this could be generalized to clinical care in general, potentially, to learning, for instance. I've been asked often, do you think Zoom lectures are as effective as in person? And for the very reasons you just said, I mean, I, I think it's not, potentially. Something happens when you have a group of people in the same space, and it's almost an emergent phenomenon that happens. Well, that that's a, quite an interesting finding, and um, you know, a lot of people see the advent of telemedicine as a good thing because it potentially expands access to people in places that are underserved. And and so, what you're saying is true. It's probably better than nothing, but it is interesting. That there may be a gradient of effectiveness, and so we can make recommendations based on on evidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it was a very algorithmic kind of conversation, like, oh, you know, what are your risk factors for cholesterol? Yes. And should I do a statin or yes. not? You know, that maybe could be successfully yes. with telemedicine. Well, CBT does seem to lend itself more to that kind of thing. And there are some a couple of pres- prescription digital therapies that are based on CBT that have shown effectiveness. I don't know that there's been head-to-head comparisons with live. But, I don't think so. No one has ever done it, as far as I'm aware. Well, yeah, but CBT being sort of manualized anyway, and there's homework and all of this, it may may lend itself better than, than this kind of treatment. So again, more options, more variety are good things. And again, these are not, are not either or. They're potentially things that you can do more than one of them, the same modalities at that's, the same time. That's right. You could take the drug, do CBT, and meditate. <laughs> if you're so, so inclined and have the time. Um, 
So I, I'm sure you, you mentioned you are working in the anxiety field, uh, in the anxiety space. Are there are there other exciting areas of research? Are there other are there other treatments that you're excited about or that you're looking into? Well, um, because I've been looking at non-pharmacologic treatments, mm-hmm. like in this study and the previous, um, people have it, it looks like people are looking into um, other sort of uh, non-mental health clinic type approaches that people mm-hmm. can do for self-care that could reduce anxiety symptoms. So um, there's all kinds of interest now in uh, exercise. I was going to ask really about good, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, the, it's stronger in the depression literature, but yes, there is yes. some suggestion that uh, regular aerobic exercise can help with anxiety symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's a little bit of in nutrition mm-hmm. and uh, changes in the microbiome mm-hmm. of the you know gut mm-hmm. that suggests that that could also be impactful. Um, but I also think that after COVID, there is a sort of distress feeling that people get due to social isolation yes. that sometimes is described as anxiety just because in our culture we don't have a lot of words for like this sort of distress and feeling upset and, uh, you know, rates of um, anxiety have gone up hugely since the pandemic and during the pandemic. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. I wonder if there's also something about social isolation that we need to take more seriously and get people reconnected. I could not agree with you more. And at our uh, last NEI Congress this past November in Colorado Springs, our friend Roger McIntyre gave a really stunning lecture on loneliness. And he pulled together all the evidence on loneliness, not only obviously for depression and anxiety, but also the effects on somatic illnesses, on physical illnesses. And there's quite a bit of evidence that loneliness is bad for us as human beings in many, many more ways than one. And uh, so interventions, and there are some interventions being looked at that have to do with ways of socialization and appropriate social contact. Uh, simple things such as having uh, someone just call, uh, and say an elderly person who's kind of shut in, call them a couple times a week and just, you know, have a, a, just a chat, a conversation. Something as simple as that has raised uh, someone's uh, state. So I think we may be on the cusp of exactly what you're talking about. As well, in social Perhaps media, we should all, yeah, we should all read Robert Putnam's book *Bowling Alone*. Oh, I don't know. See that what? No. Oh, no. yes, it was a major sociologic work looking at the uh, decrease in civic engagement and community organizations and yes. like sports. Yes. You know, where there used to be in the 1940s and 50s, yes. most like they he looked in these certain towns. So, you yeah, know, men were uh, in bowling bowling clubs. leagues or clubs. Yeah, and then yeah. <laughs> yes. And whereas now, you know, people, you know, bowling alone, that's the name yeah. of the book. It's an incredible study. Interesting. But it also it helps uh, contrast, you know, yes. what, how, you know, life was lived back then and later on. There's no question about it. I've been thinking a lot about that and how the effects of social media, which theoretically was supposed to connect us, but in many ways it has divided us and isolated us more. And it's also, um, it's this artificial communication or this artificial socialization, you know. I think of my, I have two uh, older teenage boys who uh, tell me this is how they socialize with their friends, you know. And in my day, we went out and played basketball or football or went to the mall, you know, whatever. So uh, we guess we have to uh, we have to evolve with the times, but I, I could not agree with you more that loneliness is a, is a real consequence of this and a real scourge for our society. And as you mentioned, also the breakdown of, of a lot of the the fiber, uh, the structure of our society. Yes, yes. And I think it makes people anxious. Mm, there's no question. I'm sure of that. Think about how reassuring it is sometimes when you just share something with a friend, you know, and over a cup of coffee or whatever. You know. um, I don't know. We may be losing that. Well, I don't know that we're going to solve that problem today, but we can certainly <laughs> put our finger on it. Um, do you see, do you see that, that's back, coming back to mindfulness, of course, uh, and related the techniques, do you see an evolution or do you see, where do you see that going in the future? Um, I think that, that uh, the research will, will have to keep up with the way people are using mindfulness practices mm-hmm. um, because, you know, there's an interest in having mindfulness 
in schools or, yes. um, you know, in other environments. Mm-hmm. And the research really has to keep up with mm-hmm. those, uh, uh, I don't, I should say like, uh, ambitions mm-hmm. because we're asking a lot from, from this practice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, for example, adapting my, trying to adapt mindfulness into an a, a, a asynchronous yes. format, like an app, oh. you know, where people say, Oh, I, I tried mindfulness, but it, it doesn't work. It didn't work for me. Right. <laughs> Because they never had a teacher, yeah. you know, and they never really tried it in the traditional mm. way. So we just have to make sure that the hype doesn't precede the actual evidence base. Well, you're absolutely right, though. The, the term mindfulness is really used quite a bit, not just in clinical settings now. It's out there in the, in the lay public and the, and the lay press. And you're right. People are probably not using that term rigorously. They're sort of throwing it around, sloshing it around, I guess, a little bit. So, th- so this is something where uh, the kind of research you're doing and the publication you're doing can be so helpful. And I'm so glad our audience is listening and learning about this. And hopefully you will also think more deeply about this. And, and you and the audience will learn, take the time to learn more about this because this is uh, evidence-based. This is an effective treatment that I think we do need to have in our toolbox and be able to offer to our patients. So unfortunately, we're running out of time, Liz. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or suggestions for for our audience? Well, if anyone's thinking, I tried mindfulness and I can't do it yes. because they had thoughts, yes. that's don't give up because yep. the, the point is not that I not have thoughts, right? Some people uh-huh. feel like uh-huh. I didn't achieve a state where I was in, in total emptiness yes. of thoughts. Yes. That's impossible for a human being. Yes. But rather, it's the changing the relationship with the thoughts or other mental phenomena. Something arises, and you're like, oh, yep, there it is, and it passes mm-hmm. away. Mm-hmm. That's really all it is. Okay. Well, thank you, and thanks for demystifying it. And I want to thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are. You mentioned that you're in demand uh, for interview requests because of, of uh, this research that you're doing. So thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sure. And I want to thank you and the audience for listening to us on this NEI podcast. For more information about more of our educational offerings, please go to our website, which is neiglobal.com. That's neiglobal.com. Thanks very much for listening. This is Dr. Andy Cutler. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. For more information about NEI and our premier educational content, please visit neiglobal.com. A rate cutoff for the 2024 NEI Synapse is fast approaching. If you have yet to complete your registration for the conference known as the Nerve Center for Optimizing Patient Care, do so today before rates increase. The 2024 event is being held April 19th through the 21st in person at the Red Rock Casino Resort and Spa in Las Vegas and via simulcast online. Secure your spot today at nei.global forward slash synapse.